Hello. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you and welcome to the YCIG session 2023 at the IGF 2023. Uh, in this session, we will be discussing about the uh, prospect did how uh, based on our own experience and the case that we observe in uh, our region um, about participating or uh, participation of the U at the IGF time uh, mechanisms so and what will be our difficulty to participate and what will be our uh, what are the barrier that and challenges that we are facing right now. So first of all, before um, start the discussion, uh, I would like to uh, um, introduce about the YCIG a bit. Anyway, this is Pio from the, uh, th my name is Pio Dilin from Myanmar, and I'm now uh, contributing at the YCIG steering committee. Um, to 2023 and from the Asia representing the Asia Pacific region. So we have the <coughs> uh, five committee members from the different region. And we have the Nicolas from uh, Nicolas uh, who are from the Latin America and Caribbean crew. We also have the committee member Marisha from the African crew and we have uh, Marco and Sharon, uh, who are representing the Eastern and the Western European crews and others. So, what is the YCIG and what are we doing right now, and how we are uh, trying to uh, contribute at the IGF view community? Um, first of all, we have uh, um, we have been then for the. Uh, the the article which is about the introduction uh, intro uh for for the newbie of the IGF uh young people who would like to uh, who are get uh who are start engaging at the internet government community so the first the article name is uh, IGF ABCs for newbie uh, in that article we have been uh, introduced about the internet government and uh, also we have been uh, introduced about the uh, IGF 2022 and how it is going on to be happen last years and what is the need of the IGF and and so on. That is um, one of the our initial stage to uh, step uh, to talk about the IGF as a young people and to start uh, their understanding uh, to reading this article, uh, like how the internet government community work and so on. Another thing is about the, another article is about the introduction road to the IGF 2023. We have been uh, published that article on our website uh, for introdu introducing about the IGF 2023 to the young people who are interested in the internet governance and who would like to participate as the IGF 2023. And also, of course, for better understanding on about the IGF 2023 uh, from the youth perspective. Um, YCIG, for your better understanding, uh, YCIG uh, is uh, one of the dynamic coalition on the internet government community. Uh, we are uh, to open and uh, uh, we are open and we also welcome the young people from the all around the world to and also our visions and missions are very oriented to what to empowering and 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 having them to be participate uh, to participate at the internet government community and also of course to represent the young people voices in the internet government community uh, and amplifying our um, uh, uh, difficulties and issue that we are facing in the uh, uh, and of course we uh, it is to amplify about the um, uh, regional issue at the every level uh, at the com uh, internet government community. So um, that is the thing that that basically introduction about uh, introducing about the YCIG and 
and I would like to uh, pass or uh, pass the floor to the um, Marisha, who are now currently trying online to uh, introduce herself a bit and a bit. Marisha, are you ready to right now? Thank you so much, Theo. Yes, I am. And good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone online and on site. My name is Marisha Abdul Chilunda, and I am the YSIG representative for the region of Africa. And I also am fortunate enough to assist the, the Internet Society with the coordination of their alumni network. I am um, I'm also a committee member of the Youth Standing Group of the Internet Society. And um, together with these various forms, um, we focus on youth empowerment in the internet governance and internet ecosystem. Um, partly, I also um, am fortunate enough to be managing a movement called the Elevator Africa Network where we empower women and girls, um, both of African descent and globally, to take up a decision-making um, seat at various internet-related events across the world. Um, this is my second year serving on the committee of the Youth Coalition on Internet Governance. And we also follow all of the youth developments um, in the internet governance ecosystem across the various countries in Africa. Um, perhaps later on, I will share a bit more about that and also about our collaborative efforts across the different groups that I have mentioned before, which is the Internet Society and also um, a little bit about um, our collaboration with the Youth Standing Group at a, at a later point. But um, for now, I can hand over back to my co-speakers for today. And I also just want to welcome everyone to this session. I hope you would have a lovely one. Thank you so much, Theo. Back to you. Thank you, Marisha, for introducing us about yourself. And, and also, I would like to uh, pass the floor to the Gerald, who is <laughs> joining on site here. He also a part of the YCIG steering committee member. So why not you introduce yourself? Yeah, uh, I'll go ahead. My name is João Pedro. Uh, I come from Portugal. My background is uh, data scientist. And that data science and I work for a um, public traded company uh, that is bringing digital market to the African continent. The um, participation and joining, so this is my first year in the steering committee. Um, although I've been collaborating and um, contributing to the community for a while now in different perspectives. Um, I'm very, very happy with the um, with the structuring and um, all the, the work that has been done to formalize uh, and uh, award credibility to the, to the coalition. Um, I'm not mentioning, but I know there was um, good work done in the past by the previous members of the steering committee. So for me, it was very, um, very much an honor to, to continue the steps of those who's been guiding the, the youth community so far. Uh, thank you. Thank you for your introduction. We still have the three most speakers, so uh, I will pass the floor to the another speaker at this moment. But uh, I would like to request the speaker to squeeze the time because we have the very tight limitation. So uh, and there is another guest speaker um, who are joining all sides. So <laughs> let's welcome to the. Wait. Yeah, okay. Um, uh, okay, uh, let's welcome to the Nicholas uh, for introducing uh, himself. Thank you. Nicholas, are you here? Okay, hello everybody, Nicolas Fumarelli. I am coordinator of the <coughs> Youth Lack ICF, uh, 
uh, initiative and also Utah Chef Uruguay. And uh, this year I also, I'm part of the uh, program committee of the ICF Uruguay. Well, it's a pleasure to be here with all of you in the YCIG main session. What we have today to present is uh, some results from our case study. We have analyzed throughout this year different UTICF initiatives that are being taking place around the world. We have been in touch with them. Our role as a YCIG is to bring more youth voices at the Internet Governance Forum in each of the, of the facets from the national to the sub-regional to the regional to the global ICF. And that, that is why we normally at the YCIG, we have board members from each of the UTICF regional uh, initiatives because it's a good uh, it's a good position to to be in the YCSG because you can you can have fa uh, facilities to to interact with the different uh, coordinators and just to mention some of the the highlights we we have from our case study we have identified differences in the way the UTICF performs around the world for example i will start giving some examples uh, in latin america and caribbean as you know we, we started with the youth observatory in 2016 when when the when it was formed we, we had the, the first youth like icf in the, in costa rica in 2016 and then throughout the year we we were changing a little the format we we have been but was always based on on volunteerism and collaborative right uh, it, it is difficult for the Latin American region to receive funding because of the formalities to, to have a bank account sometimes. So we have need to, to, to develop ourselves in a, in a volunteer based. And that, that is the, the key from Latin America Caribbean. I think it's uh, always about volunteerism. We are always trying, for example, the youth like IGFDC and then last year we have coordinated with the different youth uh, national IGFs for instance, Utah ICF Uruguay, Utah ICF Argentina, in the past Utah ICF Peru, different Utah ICFs that have been from our session. And we always try to, to have like the, the regional picture, right? Uh, to talk, but there are differences. For example, we have seen in this case a study that the Utah ICFs in Asia Pacific sometimes uh, are uh, having uh, <clears throat> differences, uh, cultural differences in terms of, uh, for example, uh, the inclusion of the governments in the in the discussions. Uh, there are some countries where uh, it's not so easy for the youngers to to have uh, conversations or, or at least to discuss the ma major topics with the with the government because it's a it's a it's a problem. It's a uh, they, they could be in conflict. Actually, uh, the government uh, don't want to be like involved. And for example, we have the the, the Euro dig and the youth dig when that is different, they, they have uh, more inclusion with the national, with the regional ICF and they, they have had uh, reporting on different subjects and they, they, they normally uh, adapt the topics uh, from the UDIG and the EuroDIG and they, they are more in a conversation. And for example, in Africa, it's totally different because they, they have, uh, the governments are totally involved in the, in the ICFs. That is a, another difference um that that is good to highlight i don't want to, to waste so much time but but the idea is that uh, in the second part of this main session we will hear all all the thoughts of the audience obviously but uh, we have identified that there is a, a lack of a, a common reporting tool a, a common schema uh, for reporting because the icf is based on bottom-up structures so this need to be uh, from the national giving the conversation uh, in 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 the form of an output or, or a report to the to the regional and then to the global but for example in latin america and caribbean we have had the utah ICF brazil for instance talking about digital inclusion uh, about the cyber security but then when when we come to the youth like icf to the regional picture we discuss on different things right uh, the, this is this is totally incoherent in, in, in the sense of the bottom up so our idea or our recommendations uh, conclusions derived from from the case study is that we we could create a, a common platform a common a way of reporting with uh, reporting by topic, reporting by stakeholders. So that way we could have more coherence in the way of, of the bottom up structure to the ICF. So forming these this panels at the global and the regional level uh, from the outside, from the insights uh, that came from the, from the different uh, uh, sub levels, right? That is uh, all for now. So giving the floor to, to the other speakers and then we will continue this conversation about the differences and commonalities between the Utah ICFs. 
Uh, thank you, Nicole, as for uh, uh, and sharing about the case study you as well as Liz. And maybe probably we can explore more about uh, the case study that you mentioned uh, in the next session. Is Marco is online? So uh, I think uh, one of the speaker has an issue to contact the internet. So even though we are at the internet cafe forum, so uh, that's okay. We can move into the next question, which is about the um, going into the case study that we would like to uh, that that we have been experiencing um, based on our um, uh, current in our respective region. So let's move to the uh, case study. So uh, let's go to the African group uh, case study first. That uh, So let's invite the speaker, uh, Malaysia, from, uh, who is going to share about uh, the case study that uh, she would like to uh, present. So Thank you, Fio, and I will be very brief. Um, we observed quite a few um, youth IGFs at the Africa or in the African region, and we are exceptionally proud to, to communicate, like Nicholas has um, so beautifully mentioned, that um, our governments are coming to the table a bit more than in previous years. Um, we do see a concerted effort, especially um, at regional meetings like the regional Africa IGF, um, for involving more young voices in the actual meeting. I do see a lot of the um, participation being on day zero, and um, we do want to um, advocate for our youth being more um, involved in main sessions at the both um, at national level and at the regional Africa meeting. Um, what we tend to see is um, there being youth IGFs held on the first or the day zero of uh, the Africa meetings and the main sessions then being held by um, speakers or, or leaders and experts of industry, government, private sector and so forth. Um, we often see our youth being in helping positions instead of collaborative um, interactions and partnerships. It's not enough for our youth to be at the table. We now want to move it a step ahead for youth in Africa, especially um, since I'm speaking from, the, uh, from an African um, perspective, uh, to be considered as co-collaborators and co-creators of the conversations that happen within um, the internet ecosystem, especially as it, um, you know, as, as it pertains to the developments of the internet across Africa. Um, I'm very proud to also share, and I'll do this very briefly, that we have new um, youth IGFs happening and springing up across um, the region, a very specific one being the youth IGF in Ethiopia, uh, where we hosted the global IGF in 2022. So this year, 2023, we are hoping to see a successful run of the Youth IGF in Ethiopia, um, being hosted also by a, a supporter of the Youth Coalition and Internet Governance and a co-collaborator of our work, Sabah uh, Tiku. We wish you all the best. Um, and I will pause for now and hand over back to my, my co-speakers for today. But if you would like any further news or, or feedback on what is happening in Africa, I'm very happy to jump in again and also very open to questions when the time comes. Thank you so much, team. Thank you. Thank you for sharing about the perspective from the African side. So uh, I will move to the next speaker, uh, um, Gerald. Uh, he, he will be sharing about the consultation process. So uh, I will, let me invite him to, the, to this uh, floor. Yep. So actually, we skipped a little bit the the, um, the line the lineup that we had here. So the idea was for us to um, deep dive also to explain how we reached here, how um, how the youth coalition 
contribu contributed to the preparation and the participation of young people uh, in the in the in the community in the ecosystem of the internet governance. And um, on that, I w was actually invited to speak about the collaboration that the um, Youth Coalition did with um, the Youth Standing Group from Internet Society. Um, it, it's an interesting use case because um, the whole process was very, um, very transparent from the beginning. It was we tried to include as many youth as we could from the different youth initiatives, um, meaning formalized youth IGF, uh, movements, other initiatives with um, interest to the internet governance. So it didn't mean, uh, it didn't really uh, mean that you had it to be part of the community already. So we were trying to also invite newcomers to participate in the uh, creation uh, process and submission of uh, sessions. I think that's one of the innovative parts or one of the best practices that we can share from this consultation process because typically what we have is newcomers only joining for the event and joining without the notion or without the impression that they contributed to the lineup and the schedule. And this was very interesting. Um, we gathered or we rallied more than 100 people um, in, in the process. Um, it took us um, a few months and I do have the numbers. So um, being, let me just get it here. So um, yeah, so in the end um, we did, uh, we did start and um, uh, we did start uh, 72 uh, applications, or we, we start drafting 72 sessions, uh, from which, of course, the process didn't finish for all of them. And uh, I think this is also, this is also um, good to reflect on, because it doesn't mean that um, first you need to deliver a lot of sessions. Uh, I do believe that we need to contribute with relevant content, with meaningful um, agenda by uh, also interested people. Uh, so from 72 that we started, um, we, did we did end up um, submitting 49 sessions. So we dropped uh, 23. And uh, from these 49 sessions, we did uh, get 10 uh, out of those 49. So we're talking about uh, roughly 20% of the sessions we proposed being accepted, which is, uh, I must say, quite positive, even fro from the perspective of um, the different youth that participated. Uh, I was part of the, so the youth, the youth coalition took a coordination role for, for the process and um, seeing how the different um, people from around the, the world um, collaborated to design the concept, the topic, uh, based also on their own interests. It was very interesting. Um, I do remember that in the end, uh, we did have um, also the, the ability and perhaps a little bit the difficulty of allocating um, different speakers to the different sessions. Because, uh, as you know, also uh, with a packed with a packed vision that IGF, when the schedule came up, um, since we have a lot of youth involved in the, the activities, we did have some clashes. So in the end, it was it was an interesting experience. I list it as I said as a best practice um, of how to include not all not only uh, people that are already involved uh, in the IGF but also as a way of bringing new people uh, without uh, needing to, um, or without them to uh, start right away from an event that they didn't contribute to. Uh, thank you, Joro. I think it is very effective way for the meaningful participation of the young people through the consultation process to engage in this community. I 
also hope that as uh, YCIG, we can continuously support the MP band for more for their empowering dance and encouraging them to more engage in this community. So now let me pass the floor to the Nicholas if you are ready. And Nicholas will share about the uh, also share about the case study from the Latin America perspective. So uh, let's wait and Nicholas. Yes, thank you so much, Fio. So uh, we we were saying that the uh, they are diverse uh, regional perspectives. For example, Latin America to Africa, the state of the youth engagement in internet governance. Uh, young people are becoming increasingly involved in, in these discussions uh, and they, we have differences. So the case study varies the, from the regions uh, due to cultural, logistical or governmental factors, uh, as I mentioned, and some of the challenges and, and solutions the challenge is, is, is about the need for a common reporting tool, as I say, the, because there are disparities between the youth discussions and the main session topics uh, that are happening. So creating a common platform for reporting is, is, is suggested in, in this case study. Uh, there are also, uh, as Rao mentioned, emerging youth-led IGF initiatives. Uh, for example, last year we had Youth IGF Ethiopia as a new Youth IGF. We have seen uh, Youth IGF Congo, different Youth IGFs that have emerged. And it's a, it's a growing momentum and important uh, of the youth voices in the internet governance discussions. Um, also, as Mauricia highlighted, the, the, there is a... a uh, there are more youth at the table, so there is a need to move beyond and consider more collaborations and co-creations in, in the internet governance discussions. Uh, the key is the, the value of the inclusivity. Uh, we uh, have also mentioned throughout the, this speech, uh, uh, not just engaging the youth who are already in, in part of the community, but also the newcomers. Uh, this is, is a wider youth population. Uh, we need to shape discussions and, and, and sessions around that. Um, uh, one, one more to, to mention. Well, yes, so the case study recommends that we, we need to have a, a reporting tool. This is something that uh, I personally have thought in the past. And also we have had conversations with Phil at the beginning of the year. Uh, why not having a, a platform Maybe this could be also extended to all the analyze, right? Uh, the other, the other, the other day we had a session at the analyze when also a lot, lot of the coordinators were saying that there is a, a lack of coherence sometimes in, in in the issues we are addressing. We are trying to have the regional picture. Uh, so the learnings from the Utah IGF experiences that uh, we can do that. We we can have the, the regional picture, but. We need to be serious about the, the reporting because sometimes when, when you are doing a youth IGF, people is starting from scratch again and again and talking, okay, we will discuss about, I don't know, digital inclusion. Okay, what is what is digital inclusion again? No, so I think we need to, to start from what where, where we left in the last uh, sessions, right? So that, that could be the way to, to evolve in the ecosystem and to have some uh, practical uh, conclusions, practical steps uh, for what the, the, the objectives we, we want to achieve. Um, there is a variety of topics, right? As we know, uh, this year IGF is considerably important because we have eight different topics. So it's, it's something that we, we are seeing that there are a more a wide range of things and we identify that there are separate uh, topics. Uh, it's not me that, that identified, but the IGF itself, because eight topics is a is something that we we never have have been before in, in the IGF. It's a well structured division of, of topics uh, to work on. Uh, so yes, in my personal opinion, and because of my experience also in, in the LAC region, is that we we are lacking you know, of this uh, cooperation uh, uh, between the different initiatives to have a common sense, right? We are. Uh, addressing issues, we are finding the, or mentioning challenges and solutions. The youngers are the ones that that has the solutions uh, for some of the major problems that sometimes the policymakers or more senior uh, speakers or stakeholders in in the ecosystem uh, know what are the challenges, but doesn't know uh, really what what are the possible alternatives or, or solutions. So I, I think there is an important role of the youth in in decision making that we are we. 
because at the beginning when, when the Utah ICF were formed and, and all the thing, it was most uh, about uh, training, right? Capacity building and training for the youth. It was like, okay, the youth are here to learn, uh, uh, but now we are shifting into something that is, no, the youth has the solutions. And that is important, but we are not still seeing, uh, for example, uh, in the leadership panel, some positions where, where the youth are having like uh, a specific uh, uh, attributes or, or a specific, uh, not, not to say both, but at least a, a voice in shaping the, the future of the internet governance. Uh, as you know, the Youth Coalition on Internet Governance this year has provided uh, a, a, submission, uh, a, a submission to the Global Digital Compact on different fields because we have organized in the past different workshops, as you uh, could see, also in cooperation with other groups, like Shaw mentioned, we, this year we, we had an extreme relationship with the Internet Society Youth Standing Group, and also Mauricia is leading the ISOC Alumni Network. So we have had several speakers from all around the world, youth specifically, uh, talking about different subjects with uh, guest speakers, for example, just to mention a few, we have had workshops about interplanetary internet, about encryption, about artificial intelligence, uh, gender bias, different things that, that are like the major topics or the hot topics of, of the year, basically. And so this collaborative spirit and, and this way of doing things that the youth has, I think is considerable. And it's not the way that the, the, the other, uh, as I mentioned before, the senior stakeholders that are uh, more than 10 years in this ecosystem are doing things. So we we have, a, or, or the youth have a, a new way to, to see or to foresee the future and to have actionable steps that that is, is important to, to take into account and, and well, to, to construct and to leave them the opportunity to be more involved in, in, in the decision making itself. So with the full issue of the Global Digital Compact, we have had this series of recommendations that are specific recommendations on the different topics and also a, a, a strong part about the youth engagement. We have put ideas on the funding and, and different conclusions we have had. But at the end, it's, it's, it's that. It's like recognizing that the youth has a voice and, and they are shaping really the, the future of the internet governance as never seen before. So that is my personal uh, opinion and, uh, and also derived from, from the case study and the way Global Digital Compact Consultation. Thanks. Thank you, Nicholas. I think the last speaker will be me <laughs> while moderating at the same time speaking. So, it's, um, so uh, I'm from the Asia Pacific region. So I would like to uh, uh, presence. Uh, I would like to presence about the one case study, which is a youth statement and, uh, that was developed during the Asia Pacific UIGF this year in Australia, Brisbane, Australia. So. Uh, so that's uh, in for developing this statement, uh, the participants who are the multi stakeholder coming from the different background like private sector, technical community, civil societies, and government sector also contribute to this uh, youth statement, uh, uh, raising uh, the advisors uh, r related to the digital transformations and. Uh, uh, your participation at the internet government community, uh, especially in the Asia Pacific region. So, uh, I will read out. So, I will read this out. Uh, base. I, I'm not sure. Um, I will get a chance to share the link at this moment because I'm not trying it on this one. So, that would be great if someone can share uh, the use statement uh, on some chat later. So the use statements, uh, let me read out up, uh, about the use statement. The use statement for YGF 2023 was deployed by the YGF, Asia Pacific uh, UIGF participants as they took uh, on the roles of the various stakeholders, including the private sector, technical community, civil society, and the government. Uh, the first uh, topic is about the digital transformation for repeating the trust. The digital age makes trust crucial against the bad trust offering, reliance on the technologies and possible risks related to the data breaches. 
data privacy problems and an etiquette practices, strengthening digital regulation while resolving such problems would aid both public and the private sector in winning back the trust of their user, clients, and the state other stakeholder. This is a shared responsibility with the cus uh, customer while make it important to be a positive attitude as well as have a digital fundamental knowledge. This creates a positive digital environment that encourage uh, trustworthiness, reliability, and etiquette technology. Yeah, this is about relating to the digital transformation for building uh, trust among the different stakeholder i think the trust issue is one of the biggest uh, concerns of between the different stakeholder according to this use statement so let me move to the another part of these statements uh, the title will be the moving towards an inclusive and trustworthy digital space digital space engage in the civil society and requires the internet as a tool for cultural, social, knowledge, and political agenda. Equals and safe access to the internet for the use, to use safely and equally is a top priority. This would give power and information sources to young women for their digital literacy. That is uh, uh, totally true that the safe and sound environment is also needed when using the internet. We should have the equal safe, uh, equal and safe access to the internet for young people to get access to digital technology. The next part is about the equal access to the digital ecosystem. The close relationship between the digital device, the internet, and society translate to the digital poverty becoming a serious threat. These identified main problems are the, the current technology in infrastructure and sustainability of that infrastructure along with the limited internet literacy requires a sound legal framework in addition to multi-stakeholder collaboration. Ultimately, internet literacy training for the general user will shake the cyberspace environment. We are also having the uh, uh, issue uh, with the um, uh, internet literacy, for example, like Epico uh, Kekkein is one of the ASMA that also be uh, that is launched by the APNET. Uh, APNET is like be forbidding the capacity of the internet user uh, 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 by playing the game. It is kind of like educating and entertaining at the same time for building the uh, user capacity about the internet infrastructure. That is uh, one of the core is uh, uh, related to the internet literacy. So let me move, uh, let me go into the last part. Sorry for consuming so much time. <laughs> uh, this will be the last part. Um, the last part will be about the collaborative efforts in creating a safe and unbiased internet with a focus on the creation of accessibility and sustainable internet infrastructure the promotions of user accessibility will be enhanced. Digital regulation will be improved via the collaboration with other community during efforts to develop trustworthy AI algorithms through the minimization of the undesired bias. The technical community should be held accountable for what they have in the creation of the C cyber sp uh, space for youth. Uh, this is also very important. Uh, in Asia Pacific region, APNI is doing well for uh, having out the young people through their fellowship, uh, uh, for building their capacity uh, about the internet, not only to for better understanding the internet infrastructure, even though the young people are from the other, not from the technical background, it is a lot. It, it, they allow uh, the young people to apply the fellowships and they have been selected as uh, th those young people to better understand about the internet infrastructure and internet policy uh, um, through the capacity building program and also inviting them to the uh, EPNIC conference, uh, which is the annual conference that, uh, that, uh, that they are uh, lots of uh, discussion about the uh, and internet infrastructures and so on, and internet issues, of course. So this is the end of the use statement that has been 
uh, that brought at the EPYNGF uh, this year in the Australia Brisbane. So now we are coming to the uh, cl uh, open mic session. If you have any question, um, please grab the mic and ask the question. Feel free to ask the question to the speaker. Uh, any question will be welcome, of course. Is there any question so far? Please state your name and where you're coming from. Hi, I'm, uh, I'm Philip Moni, and I represent the Samoa Information Technology Association in Samoa. So I come from the Pacific uh, developing island of Samoa. Um, but I can see already that there is a uh, very uh, lack of uh, participation of youth in this session. So um, it kind of, that is, uh, my, my, my question will be around uh, the youth inclusion in IGF, which is um, uh, the reason why I came to this session. So um, the, the use case study that was uh, spoken by uh, I think Mauritia from Africa, uh, um, I totally support the fact that um, the problems that are facing with inclusion of youth not being able to participate in higher forums is a problem also in developing nations like Samoa. Uh, in my case, I know for a fact that Samoa has a really lack of partici uh, participation and also knowledge in terms of uh, uh, YCIGF. So my question is, what um, what are some of the um, what are some of the solutions that have been implemented to um, in terms of barriers um, in order to be inclusive in such um, forums as well, especially from the Asia uh, Asia Pacific uh, side as well, um, and and how can we be more how how can developing countries be more participative? In, in, in such uh, forms. Thank you. Thank you for your question. I'm really happy to assist this question because this is, uh, you know, like Asia Pacific is uh, kind of like the big regions and we also have a different, in uh, many internet issue uh, in our region. So, and, but the thing is that as we, as I mentioned, like the youth statement I, re uh, I read out is coming from the Asia Pacific UIGF. So my recommendation of from my perspective, my recommendation will be to engage at the regional, to try to engage at the regional UIGF. Maybe probably they are, if you are coming from the technical background, that they are also the fellowship program for the young people to build their capacity about the internet and of course to better understand about the internet ecosystem. So that is a thing that we can explore ourselves how we can engage in the internet governance community in the region first. And then we can step into the another uh, phase like we can uh, through that uh, step, we can go into the another mood like we start engaging at the global EU community for example like uh, right now, it's opening the ISRU ambassador program. It's open to the uh, everyone from the world. So uh, you can also uh, apply that program. And maybe through that program, you can start engaging with the global EU community. And the another, um, at local level, there is, uh, for me, like I'm here representing the YCIG as well as I'm a coordinator of the UIGF Myanmar. So uh, you can initiate the UIGF uh, in your local community if you have uh, the enough resource and the capacity. If you don't have, that, that is fine. You can start working to engage, to talk about the internet governance with your friends, maybe th your colleges, and then uh, maybe you can uh, advocate or persuade them to initiate such kinds of the uh, U internet governance forum in your region. And also, 
if I'm not mistaken, that there are the people who are coming from your country as also engaged at the Asia Pacific uh, Regional Internet Governance Forum. Asia Pacific Regional Internet Governance Forum is not like a, uh, it's not like a EU forum. Uh, it is bigger. It is a, a regional one. Um, it is bigger, and many organizations are coming and attend to that. Uh, uh, that forum, so maybe probably you can find someone who can support to initiate uh, that uh, the youth internet governor forum in your community. If for studying the policy discussion about the issue that uh, that are currently happening in your region, so that is my uh, recommendation. This recommendation actually came from my experiences because I'm I was in uh I started my internet governance journey with this way. I started trying the regional one, regional UIGF and then I go back to my countries and get involved at the local level. And then I'm trying to extend my network with at the global level. Maybe that would be the good strategy that you can think about. Yeah. Yeah. I also have a few thoughts on the on the question that you posed and of course Thanks very much for the question. So, are you a newcomer? First IGF? Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, uh, the first two thoughts that came to my mind, uh, first uh, uh, on the barriers. So, on the barriers of people to know about the topic uh, and to be motivated to participate on the topic. Um, usually, uh, and maybe it's the case um, from where you're coming from, but there's a lot of language barriers. There's a lot of also political um, uh, non-priorities, let's say, that come to the digital versus others that are more tangible um, locally. And uh, usually this is more pervasive uh, in smaller countries. So you see where I'm going. Um, here I'm... I mean, it's complicated because how do you break the language barrier? You either have um, a strong language, let's say it, or let, let's put it like that, or it's indeed difficult to find the content, to learn about it, to uh, even to exchange about it. Uh, and that is a, a quite difficult one. But the second one, I was thinking, okay, this is a newcomer asking why there is no interest or how uh, why there is no interest among my community to discuss this um, and justifying it also a little bit as um, okay there is not really the possibility to do so and here uh, what I thought was how we sometimes um, miss the opportunity uh, of of iterating, I would say, um, over the participation programs and initiatives and funds and scholarships that we run for people to come here. That's so many times, and I have several examples that I, I would prefer actually not to list, um, that were very focused on bringing uh, the individual A for his characteristics and his background X, Y, and Z to the discussions on sites, but not really focused on the ability that that person could, after participating, start influencing back the community. Because uh, if you look at the IGF at, let's say, global level, you have the possibility to reach out to stakeholders from very different uh, regions, from very different areas, uh, with a substantial size, let's put it that way. Um, and this is often not channeled back to the community. Uh, I've actually argued for this in the past that if we wanted to talk about um, the complete circle of a participation uh, process for a newcomer, the first example I spoke in the beginning of the session, which is, okay, make, make sure that the newcomer takes uh, part of the process from the creation of the event or the initiative uh, and the example of the co-creation uh, of, of sessions to submit to the IGF is a great example. But then moving forward is how can you go back or what mechanisms 
the funding program that you're in or the initiative um, that you applied to participate is facilitating to you? What tools are you getting back to for you to influence your community? For me, it's very important. And um, uh, for some, it's it comes down or it boils down to this sense of individual responsibility of giving back. But I'm sure that there's more to do on this topic. Yeah, uh, is there anyone who would like to add more? Yeah, sure. We have here on the floor a very experienced young person. <laughs> Sorry, I, I chose to use that mic so I can look at you. That seems that seems far nicer than you looking at my back, looking at me through the camera uh, while we're standing in the same room. Uh, my name is Nadia Czechia, and I am the coordinator of youth activities uh, for Europe. And uh, I really like your question, and I hope you don't mind me generalizing. So um, I, I, I'd like to talk a little bit about culture. So if we're thinking about um, history and, and, and thinking about the West, um, growing up um, after the world wars, the boomers, they had plenty of resources and they had to be self-made. There was not a lot of information available. They had to learn skills and things on the go. And so they always like to say they're self-made. You get things through hard work. But then you had afterwards Gen X coming in. Gen X believes in mentorship. They believe finding someone that had achieved something that you wanted to go to. And that is what you are going towards and finding the right person to get you to that place. Um, that could be someone taking under the wing or uh, learning from their life journey to get to that moment. Then you have the millennials. The millennials always cry, that's what they say. But millennials then had to focus on peer-to-peer -peer learning. Mentors can only have so many mentees. Um, there was, uh, increasingly there was a lack of resources and then um, there was started to be a disconnect as uh, uh, Gen X had uh, Less, uh, as less and less resources were available, but also in, in terms of the West, that um, uh, there were uh, increasingly more uh, people coming into the world. So millennials did peer-to-peer -peer learning. They relied on each other to foster connections and, and move forward. And now we have Gen Z who does online learning. Any information that is online is available to them. And so you see here four generations of engaging with people, of finding things, and um, your question is extremely complex. It is so simple to put forward uh, in terms of why are we not more integrated, but it is also so complex of how can we be more integrated because uh, we are navigating different generations. We are also navigating different cultures. In the beginning it was easy, you just work with your local community, everybody understood what everything meant. Everything, uh, just a word meant the same thing in that one community. Now we are such in a global place, we are talking about the meaning of digital sovereignty, the meaning of uh, sitting together. So I used to study in a very international school and as a European in the morning, I have my coffee very alone in a corner by myself. But I studied with, Amer uh, with uh, Africans and they believe in community. And so they would see me alone. I'm sitting at a table of four people. They're sitting at a table of 10. I go sit separately and what they do is they pick up their trays. I'm one person, there are 10 people. They pick up their trays and come sit next to me because they believe if you sit alone, the community has rejected you and they didn't want me to feel that the community rejected them. I'm trying to mind my own business, take my time. And they're like, no, you, 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 we don't reject you. So we are going to move ourselves. A group of 10 people would move so that I would feel that I'm part of community. So how we understand, and, and, and I both loved and hated it because I loved being included and, and being supported and having that group around me, but also it is seven o'clock in the morning and I just need a cup of coffee to wake up. So it's really uh, how we then kind of try to come together and, and move forward and learning to understand how we want to uh, engage with each other and finding the right balance. When you look at, at this room, and wondering, uh, youth, you can see it both as a positive and a negative thing. Because if they're not here, they're in other sessions. That means that they're engaging in other sessions, intervening in other places. That means that they're really passionate about making sure that their content is heard. This session is looking at a case study of youth, so they're talking about the more kind of meta level, uh, the question of like, how can we have more youth participation? So them not being here means that they're there. And I think you can see that a positive or negative side. Are we 
the question I would then ask, are we still thinking enough about meaningful participation, what Fio mentioned, that meaningful participation, how are we ensuring that people continue participating in internet governance and how are they navigating? So the people who are in that room, okay, they're there. Are they learning, which is a great opportunity? Are they informing, consulting? Um, are they intervening? Are they uh, being watched? Are they using the opportunity to network? And how can we facilitate that? And then uh, part of that can be done through, you know, learning is being that self-made idea, uh, mentorship, uh, finding, navigating, oh, that's a speaker that I am, I really want to learn from that person and having the courage as a young person to step up to that per to that person and also from that person as, as an older intergenerational person to accept, um, to, to lead and, and to be a mentor. So, uh, uh, and you being here, you're doing the peer-to-peer -peer learning. So you're learning from all these people worldwide joining online and sharing the, your perceptions from Samoa. And I think you're very, uh, very brave to, to raise that issue and question. So I have no answer. I just, I'm just filling time. But um, I really love having that uh, discussion because that's uh, the di different ways allows us to kind of progress further. And if you were interested, I, I would love to sit down with you and talk about what, what would you like to achieve here and how can we as a community uh, support you in achieving the goals that you want. So thank you very much for your question. Thank you. It is very meaningful <laughs> about mentioning about the inclusion. I totally agree that we can leave no one behind, whether um, they are vulnerable or whether they are privileged. You know, like we treat all young people equally, and also we should um, we should have the strategy to move forward into the inclusion of the young people participation in not only in the internet governance global community but also at the local and regional community. It is uh, really a uh, uh, main purpose of the Internet Governance Forum. So I hope, and also I hope um, we answer, uh, we give some idea to you to what you have to work, start working for your community and how we can uh, how you can support for uh, move uh, go uh, work for the you digital inclusion uh, as uh, from the you community. So, okay. So the time being is going to end So, so uh, let's move to the lab part of lab session, like the opening re uh, closing remark from the each of the speaker. So I will uh, in uh, I will give the floor to the Alicia for her closing remark. Marisha, are you online? I am online. Thank you so much, yeah. Fio. And I actually want to just um, say a quick bit. Um, uh, let me actually just um, connect to Nadia. First, uh, that was definitely not taking up time that everything that you shared, Nadia, was so, so valuable and so relevant. I especially um, connected um, and resonated with your points on two-way mentorship. And we really want to, as a, as a closing point, especially from my perspective as an African, um, communicate back to our various stakeholders within the multi-stakeholder model that we are ready for two-way mentorship. We are ready to pour into our older generations all the learnings that we have uh, garnered from all of our interactions in the internet governance ecosystem. We are rich with information. We are rich with current developments in the internet governance ecosystem as the youth voice. And we are open to collaborating. We are open to building together. And we are excited to, to, to get those opportunities to, to share with our other generations, exactly how to maximize our collective work in creating the internet that we want. So thank you so much to everyone who have contributed in the room, to my co-speakers co as well, and my um, co-committee um, members of the Youth Coalition on Internet Governance. I applaud you for all of the work that you have done to activate the youth in this ecosystem so that many of them are not in this room today, 
but they are actually speaking at sessions in this global meeting. This is something that was very different to previous years. So I would love to just congratulate you on, on, on achieving a momental shift in interaction. And let's continue engaging. And I look forward to the IGF of 2024. Thank you so much. And over to you, Theo. Thank you. Thank you for your closing remark. Um, I think I, uh, we are in, not ready. We still have time, so we will move to the another speaker for the closing remark. So we let's welcome to the Nicholas first for his closing remark for this session. Nicholas, the floor is yours. Thank you. First, I like to address the matter of importance. Uh, as you might be aware, there was an oversight by the HF administrative team regarding the scheduling of our session. So this is primarily the reason why we have not have empty seats in the room today. Uh, some challenges uh, highlight the importance of effective communication and coordination in our interconnected digital world. Uh, but our session draws to, to close. I want to express my profound gratitude to each speaker and speaker for their invaluable contributions and your commitment, especially in the light of the challenge of, of the resilience and the passion on our community. Uh, so the reflection shared today by Nadia and the speakers on inclusivity, understanding these generational differences, uh, as we were talking in the beginning, uh, cultural nuances and the genuine drive to involve uh, and empower the youth in, in our countries and in our regions uh, has significance. No? And I hope we can continue these discussions beyond this room, fostering more a uh, culture of collaboration and inclusivity within the youth and uh, in an environment where we are not merely participants, as we have said, but dynamic co-creators. And it's important and pivotal to remember that while unforeseen challenges and like today's scheduling hiccup uh, may arise, it's our collective response our resilience to, to unwavering commitment that really define us. So um, thank you everyone to, to everyone in the session and let's remain connected, amplify our learnings, um, showing our, our internet society chapter, showing our, our uh, internet governance forum in the national uh, side, capture the, the youths that are there and, and uh, with this collective response and resilience, we, we, we will commit to and, and define a new UTIGF initiatives, new work to, to be done, and really really champion the cause of a unified and inclusive digital future. Thank you. Thank you, Nicholas. It is um, very encouraging and encouraging uh, re open, uh, closing remarks. So <laughs> I don't want to go to the, uh, I don't want to take too much time for my moderation. So I will pass the next speaker as a Jerome. No, uh, yeah, I think we can wrap up. So João Pedro from Portugal speaking again. Uh, I think that it's important that we take away, of course, uh, besides whatever calendar issue or uh, whatever reason behind it that we do indeed um, take stock of understanding why the participation is like this. Is it really based on the hypothesis that we are participating elsewhere? Is it the format? Should we revisit things from the past? So it's actually one of my uh, main takeaways. And of course, the question that was raised. So thank you very much for also raising it to attention. Um, I think in the future, it can really um, boil down to um, discussing a little bit more about the messages that we have from the different regions, uh, the way that we interacted, so more on the reporting part of how we did it, how, how we made it work. Uh, hopefully that will uh, give the opportunity for already well-established members of the community, uh, the youth community, to share that best practices with newcomers and that inspiring, of course, the newcomers to become leaders, not only in this space, but also in their own communities. With that, I think that we can wrap up right here from the floor. Um, we can we thank the, the steering committee members that join online, that couldn't join physically. Uh, we hope that you're good. Uh, and yep, you wanna close? Thank you. Um, this is the end of this session. But before ending this session, I would like to share a bit about uh, my encouraging word to those who are joining right now. So I think the important thing is ourselves 
that we have, as, as long as we have the opportunity and also, uh, and also like the as long as we have the uh, passion on the inter on addressing the community issue, we can do whatever we would like to do to engage in wha whatever well in whatever in the community. The thing is that we have to know ourselves, and we also need to pay our capacity and the skill ourselves to be in the position of the uh, representing uh, the local, regional, and global community, young people voices. We have to be, uh, we also need our capacity building, and we also need to upgrade our skill uh, to get involved. For example, like the one that Gerald mentioned, like language is one of our barriers. So we, that also, um, and uh, dragging down as to not try and not no longer participate in the community that might probably be because we might have we might not have we may or may not have the confidence in speaking english all the time sometimes we have the difficulty uh, to communicate with the people misinterpreting I misinterpreting the the main purpose and the main meanings of what we would like to talk about. So we have to think about how we can be our capacity and ourselves and how we can educate ourselves firstly. Then we can share with the young people who are around us like uh, not to be a leader all the time. It's okay to be the follower sometime like um, to engage with the young people in the different kinds of level because we also have the different personality and different culture. So the culture might probably make us to depart. But so far, uh, by building the mutual understanding and by trying to understand the culture of our communication each other, that will be also very helpful to um, keep the young people who are around us, uh, who are also very, uh, who are also skillful, uh, and who are also very um, passionate to do something for the community. That is the point that I would like to mention. Another point is that no one left behind. We have to encourage the uh, our friends and our colleagues, and we also support to each other as a young people. Uh, for the meaningful participation in the or group teams or not only to not only teams or in the community that is also very important kind of like seeing like peer to peer learning as well yeah uh, i think uh, this is uh, the i will conclude with uh, this closing remark and thank you all speaker for joining online and on site and thank you all participants for uh, attending this session. Thank you very much.